It's been more than a year in the making. Police department, anybody inside? Answer up. Do it now. Over the last hour, you've been watching KCPT's latest documentary, Our Divided City, getting at the roots of violent crime on Kansas City's east side. We want the same chance. We want the same opportunities for a job. Well, there's not a whole lot of people living around here, so many empty houses. This hour, we continue the conversation as citizens weigh in with their views, and we prod and poke for answers from neighborhood law enforcement and political leaders. We don't have enough police officers, and, and, and we need them. Because there are no grocery stores in areas, because there's no jobs available, that that might affect the crime rate. So folks are solving conflict with violence. So we really got to get back to the pre-K level and start teaching conflict resolution. We're on location at the Paseo Academy this hour for the Crime Caucus. Caucusing with our citizens, the new head of the mayor's anti-violence task force, Councilwoman Jolie Justice, two of her council colleagues, Quinton Lucas and Alicia Kennedy, Joe McHale, commander of the East Patrol Division, UMKC criminologist Ken Novak, ATF agent John Hamm, the head of the ad hoc group against crime, Damon Daniel, neighborhood leader Pat Clark, and our filmmaker, Michael Price. Like many cities in the U.S., Kansas City has two stories to tell. There's the story about the gleaming, pretty neighborhoods. When you talk to people in Kansas City, you hear a lot about the truce divide. A land of opportunity. It's mostly white. And then there's the story about the east side of town, home to the black community. Price, can I ask you, though, at the very get-go here, a year digging into this, what surprised you, having done this documentary? The levels of blight. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I... You know, I mean, there's an argument, is there not, that in a city this wealthy, here at the centre of the, the world's greatest superpower, we have thousands of people who are expected to live um, in, in an area as blighted as that which we see in large parts of the community east of Troost. That, that brings with it despair. It doesn't do a lot for hope. And the idea that we have a community that is allowed to live amongst this, it's not of their creation. Um, I think big questions should be asked about that. Okay. Major Joe McHale, what actually happened, though, that got us to the situation where we, we seem to have a handle on, on the murder rate? It may not be an acceptable level, but it was going down. And then in 2015, we see 109 murders, a 34% increase. What actually happened there? Nova was designed with one aspect of homicide in mind, and that's group and gang violence. In 2012, we started looking at the intelligence we had on the groups and gangs in Kansas City that were feuding, um, and we, we realized very quickly we were lacking in that intelligence. Who are the people that are driving the violence in Kansas City? And so in a focused deterrence model, you're only going to impact one portion of what homicides are domestic violence murders quadrupled in 2015. We had seven dead children in 2015. Um, you take those numbers and it doesn't, it doesn't take long to add that to the group violence and get to 109. 109 last year, a 34% increase on the year before. Um, we started the year with eight homicides in the first 10 days. We can talk academically about these numbers and what's actually happening, but is there a sense of panic about what is happening here? over at the ad hoc group against crime. I mean, you've been doing this a long time, Damon. There's a sense of panic. There's always a sense of urgency, especially when you're sitting across the table from a mother or a father who who's now has to bear their child. One of the things that we have to understand is that we are responding to sort of the symptoms of something much larger. And the film kind of talks about that at the beginning when you reference the redlining that has occurred and the disinvestment that has, wasn't, I mean, this doesn't happen overnight. These is, this has been decades and decades of divestment in a community uh, that was segregated by race and now by opportunity, but it's particularly economic opportunity. So that's the way that we have to really focus is looking at how do we really bring opportunity to these folks who are living east of Truth and create those kind of pathways so they can have better economic opportunities. 83% of the homicides from last year involve firearms, but we're told the state has 
hamstrung uh, Kansas City and local cities all across the state of Missouri and said they can't enact any of their own local measures to control the flow of guns. So is this an issue that is totally out of the city's control? Jolie Justice, not only are you the chair of the Mayor's Anti-Violence Task Force, you spent a decade of your life as a Missouri State Senator. You were there in Jefferson City and understand how that worked. I mean, is there nothing that Kansas City can do? No, there's always something that Kansas City can do. And um, I think that's one of the things that we are looking at as a part of this task force is number one, what is what are our options? And number two, politically, what is feasible? And so one of the things that we have to do is continue that dialogue. And I think that we're starting to see a conversation start to switch. I think we are also finally starting to see that one of the things we need is more data and we finally have a push for that information, both locally and nationwide, those are gonna make all the difference when it comes to really creating that change that you're talking about. Over at the ATF, nothing is being done on guns, John Hamm? That's what we do every day. Every gun that's, that gets, required, that gets uh, recovered as part of a crime in Kansas City is traced through ATF. We go back and we find the first lawful purchaser of that gun. And with that data, we can go back and figure out, you know, are the guns, we, we know that guns, there are straw purchasers of guns, people that buy them for people that can't have them. We know that um, there are residential burglary rings that are breaking into houses looking for, for guns and, and only guns because they can sell them quickly and they can get a good price for them. And then you, you complicate that issue with the continued narcotics trade. <clears throat> people that are doing that for a living are going to have a gun to protect the dope, they're gonna have a gun to protect the money, or they're gonna have a gun to protect their turf. Um, and we have agents on the street every day with Kansas City Police Department in embedded units uh, that do nothing but work on that. When you hear people say, well, we have laws on the books currently, they're just not being enforced, how do you respond to that? Well, I would tell you that the Western District of Missouri, uh, as far as federal prosecutions, it ranks second in the country behind Puerto Rico only uh, as doing the most gun prosecutions federally in the United States and the District of Kansas is third. We want to hear from you and we have a question already. Um, my question is to Julie, is that? Julie Justice. Justice. Yes. She said that um, what is politically feasible and what is um, those aren't like real terms for what we're talking about violence wise. Um, politically feasible, you know, what does that mean when we're talking about violence in Kansas City? What I think a lot of people left out is these blighted neighborhoods, these properties are owned by people and they're not by the people who live in the neighborhood. The majority of East of Truce who are not homeowners are renters. So some of these companies and corporations and property groups own these properties. So how are we pursuing them? Okay, and we mentioned here in the, from the questioner, the, the word politically expedient, that term didn't mean anything to the questioner. What does it mean to you, Jolie Justice? And, and I was responding to the question as it related specifically to gun laws. And is it possible for us to change gun laws on a local level since we have, frankly, a national government and a state government on both sides of the state line who refuse to respond to this issue and frankly are passing, I think, reckless gun legislation that makes things even harder in the local community. So what we are talking about right now, is there anything else we can do that we are not going to run afoul of state law, of federal law, of the state and federal constitutions? Can we still find ways to, to work on our gun laws so that we can have an impact in there? That's just one piece of the huge puzzle, though. I know that we have to look at all of the other issues that you addressed as well. Okay, and then we talked about the blight issue, and let's, let's pick apart that, because I think there's a lot of questions, and TIFF was mentioned, so we're gonna get into all of those questions next. So as we had Police Chief Darrell Forte come up with this unorthodox solution you've been reading about, for tackling the crime wave, a bulldozer, Chief Forte telling a meeting of the Board of Police Commissioners he would support diverting money from his own budget for hiring more police officers and putting it to demolishing abandoned buildings in the most crime-ridden parts of East Kansas City. Quentin Lucas, Councilman, you're the head of the Housing Committee. I mean, is this feasible? 
you know, I'm sure it's feasible, so I'm a lawyer, I'll answer one question at a time, but yes, it's, <laughs> it's feasible to spend money on demolishing houses. I'll answer what might be the next question, which is, well, do I agree with that? Uh, short answer is frankly no. Uh, and I'll give the background. Okay. And and so uh, my other question is, why not then, why not? Councilman Lucas? Thank you so much. Um, you know, growing up in Kansas City, we were working on the Bruce R. Watkins Freeway Project when I was a kid. And what that meant to me, or what I saw, was just these vacant tracts of land, lots and lots of tracts of land, that told a lot of us who live in this community that, well, just split it apart. Uh, your community's not that special. If people need it to be something, then we can just bulldoze through it. So I don't really think a bulldozer, particularly a large-scale bulldozing program, is the way to do it. Now, don't get me wrong. If there's a house that's burnt out, if there's a house that has no use any longer at all, then those need to be taken down, true dangerous structures. But in terms of an anti-crime approach, a large-scale demolition effort, I don't think is the wisest and most efficient process. So I would say to the chief, if you want to just give up police money, give us money in the land bank program so we can try to turn some of these properties into an efficient and useful function for the neighborhoods. Councilwoman Kennedy, you're the head of the Neighborhoods and Public Safety Committee. Tell us about what, I mean, how effective a strategy would that be, bulldozing those abandoned houses, as, as the police chief w recommends. Well, as a point of clarification, the, the structures he was, he was referring to were the dangerous buildings. Kansas City, we have about 870 currently um, throughout Kansas City, and most of them in the 3rd and 5th District. Um, and when you look at the map and where those structures are, they also overlap with the highest crime zones as well. Um, so part of my understanding is that we're breeding the element of crime in our community. Um, everyone I I've talked to that live in these areas, that live next to one of these structures, they want it gone. They're dealing with roads, with uh, rats. They're dealing with vagrants living um, in their in, you know, adjacent to their property, um, unsecured structures. Um, they're dealing with some environmental issues as a result of the neglect of the adjacent properties. So for a number of public safety and environmental concerns, it is a responsible approach to take for dangerous buildings. Okay. Pat Clark, well, we saw you talk about blight and the concerns of blight in the documentary, but is removing a hundred troubled houses in those hot spots more effective than hiring an additional police officer to police that? The chief even discussing that, that's somebody trying to make an attempt to do something. His, his, his job is to police the city. He shouldn't have to say, hey, well, look, if I had the money, this is what I'd do. You know, other words, he's trying to ask those people in city council, uh, the, uh, the city manager, the mayor even, hey, look, we need to start looking at this. But if I had to really talk about what's needed, we need more police officers. Because, see, as a, 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 a neighborhood president, I get hit with all kind of stuff. And the request, like, uh, well, uh, we called the police last night and it took them 20 minutes to get here. You know, how do you explain to that lady that maybe her son could have made it if that, if that policeman had got there, that, that ambulance had got there. But the fact is, is that just the chief making an attempt, you know, like I said, if, if, if we had to do one or the other, I'd say we need more police officers. But tearing down the houses, if we're going to put new ones up, I'm for it. Major McHale, you know, tearing down 100 houses, is that worth more than putting another extra uh, officer on the beat in a really hot spot crime area? Throwing cops at it isn't the solution. Policing smarter, um, making arrests that matter, that's what's going to make a difference. I mean, how long were we at war? The war on drugs. How long did a police department get put at war with its citizens? It created an us versus them mentality. We're trying to change that. Sure, tear down a house, but help them out. Build a house back. Don't leave an open lot because that, are, that, that attracts rats too and homelessness. I mean, just this week, I've got four calls from 311 that I sent people out on to, to address homeless camps in vacant lots. Coming up on the Crime Caucus, more questions and concerns from our citizens here in the auditorium of the Viseo Academy. But first, a closer look at Kansas City crime by the numbers.
We're going to go back to our audience. Yes, sir, your question. Yeah, my name is Bill. I'm from Mannheim Park, which is on the Truce Corridor. The cost of tearing down houses is significant. We don't have in the city budget right now enough money to tear down as many houses as should be torn down. So diverting money from policing into tearing down houses might not be the best economic use of our resources. But more importantly, there are some solutions being dealt with right now. And it comes via the Urban Neighborhood Initiative chaired uh, uh, by Diane Cleaver. And they are trying to get these houses marketed in, in the correct hands for people who will stabilize our blighted challenge neighborhoods. Now, I'm gonna put on my promotion hat and say that creative people are probably the best equipped to do this. The creatives, artist types, are the ones willing to struggle, always have been, and they are basically the foot soldiers of economic development. Yeah. Councilwoman Kennedy? Okay, okay, let, let's, let's get a response to your excellent question. Uh, well stated observation of what's occurring. I believe there are a much broader audience other than creative types that are willing to do that, make that investment, and be owner-occupied and stabilize the neighborhood, starting with the people who live there currently. Um, but without the access to capital and with the support, I met with city staff today and we we're talking about identifying a funding source to be able to support that. Other cities have provided, um, using HUD dollars, a forgivable loan uh, for those that are willing to live in those structures. Um, we're looking at getting a, a lender of some of our local banks to the table to make that commitment. You know, they all have an obligation with Community Reinvestment Act dollars, um, but we're looking for one of those banks to come forward to create those opportunities for those that want to live in these properties. We have about 5,000 properties in Land Bank right now um, for those that don't sell at the, tax, uh, at the tax sale. So there's a number of opportunities, um, but we want to give first opportunity for those that um, are from that community that want to live there and want to add value to it and not necessarily change the dynamic and the culture of it. Michael. Um, the problem, the problem with land bank properties is, though, that they don't reach the land bank until after four, five years or so of the person living in that, the person who owns the property not paying their taxes. So they come into the land bank, they come in, in effect, they're being assumed, the ownership of the property is being assumed by City Hall after four or five years, usually of neglect four or five years where you haven't had someone living in the property. That means that the land bank is taking on properties that are going to need so much more money to be put into them in order for them to re be rehabbed. City Hall needs to start looking at how it can get hold of these properties more quickly and City Hall needs to be looking at how it can start to recognise these properties, these 5,000 properties or so, that make up about half of the blight as an asset, as an opportunity to redevelop and not as a liability. We heard from an earlier questioner who said a lot of these homes are from these out-of-state folks. They're not living here. If you saw the letter in the Kansas City Star from Madeline in Kansas City who writes, how many of the abandoned buildings are owned by the city, Councilwoman Justice? How much tax increment financing money, Madeline says, which is supposed to benefit blighted areas, have been channeled away from the development of those neighborhoods? If TIF money were used for genuinely blighted neighborhoods, would the city have funds for the maintenance or destruction of those properties? So I think one of the great things that's happening right now, I mean, ongoing discussions, is that you have a council for the first time in a long time that is looking at all of these issues. And frankly, all of these options are on the table. We heard earlier about the issue of out of state um, and, and absentee landlords. That is an ongoing issue and we are working very hard in Jefferson City to correct state laws that will give us better tools to get folks into those houses quicker. There are also obviously the issues of tax incentives and what are we doing, where are we using them, how are we using them, what kind of skin in the game are these developers giving us and what are they giving back to the community. Right now we are having those conversations and so this is actually an excellent time for us to be hearing the ideas from the public. Councilman Lucas, I mean you certainly weren't a huge fan of the notion of just bulldozing these, these dangerous buildings. Um, what, what do you see as a solution, though? You don't think necessarily the murder rate is going to go down because somehow we've solved these uh, abandoned housing issue? No, I mean, I... So, so what is it? So, so what is the solution? I mean, I, I will just uh, reaffirm that, no, I do not think a lot of empty lots near people's houses 
solves the murder rate. If that were the case, then in the 1990s, when I was younger, I was going by all these empty lots, we would have just been great, but the murders were much higher. Actually, the first thing I would suggest is how we can keep people in property and not losing it. How can we make sure people can make renovations in their properties? How can we make sure that folks are holding on to them within their families? Helping people who are in a property now pay their Well, taxes. you're on the council, so I what am. are you doing to do that? Thank you for asking, okay. because right. just today, just today, we were able to talk about the disbursement of funds, including home repair funds that help people who are in need to try to retain their houses. The problem is, like everything else we said, there's not enough. I'll make one other brief point, though, about out-of-town ownership. Sometimes when we talk out-of-town ownership, we think of some, let's say, California entity that owns lots of houses. Often, it is actually someone who passed away's children, who may not know they have the house or do have the house. They either live in a suburb, sometimes they they live here. Sometimes people don't really know they have the house. Sometimes people don't want the house. I mean, it's not quite as as broad as it would think. So really what I want us to be able to do is invest in keeping people in properties and actually trying to make sure that we're holding on to valuable owners and tenants. KCBT's Eva Lee Bing, you have another question. Last year in 2015, uh, we bought a couple of tax houses that were in very poor condition. They were dangerous buildings. And now we have owners inside of them. 4100 is a house that Pat was thinking about destroying until we saw it. It's a six bedroom, one and a half bath house. We could not believe that these type of houses are sitting in land bank. These houses can be restored and it does not take a lot of money to do it. What, what, what line of business are you in, sir? Well, uh, I'm just an investor. Okay, I'm, an investor. I'm, 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 well, I'm we're, we're, told, investor. we're told that nobody wants to invest east of truth. Okay, I've invested $255,000 to get 20 houses and he has my portfolio in front of him. Why are you doing it and so many people aren't? I think that they're afraid of the renovation cost that takes place in the hazardous material. These houses are able to become functional and be able to place a homeowner inside of them. We have done it. We've done 20 houses like that. Check our record. Councilwoman Kennedy, if it's so easy and this man is having success, why aren't other people doing it? Again, I'll, I'll re reiterate, um, access to capital is one of the primary barriers to more investors being able to get into this market. There's no lack of interest in doing it. Um, those that have the know-how and, and have the comfort and familiarity with the community want to do it. Um, it sounds like you have all those combinations and the money to go along with it. So it makes him a prime uh, person to consider these properties. We had another investor um, that was heavily bankrolled that looked at some properties in Northeast. We gave him 100, prop matter of fact, 99 properties to consider. He went through and evaluated them, got down to 20, and they only confirmed six of those properties. The rest of them were so far gone beyond repair that it wasn't economically feasible. Because not only do you have the rehab costs, um, but to be a good investor, you want it to appraise it a certain amount when it's done. And when you have a rehabbed house next to a, a, a burnt out house, you don't get the appraised value that you would want to have. And so you have to take a very targeted block by block approach to really have the significant impact. Um, and so someone that has the means to be able to do that, an investment group. And what we've seen more recently have been hedge funds coming in, buying up these properties in bulk. So that's when you end up with the LLCs, out of state investors that are acquiring the properties in the community. Pat. Guys like this don't, don't always get entertained. They don't get the conversation that they need. So when, when you have people come in and want to develop and, and, and put stuff back together, sometimes if you, if you don't have a household name, you don't, you know, you don't get the look. You know, and the bigger thing in, 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 in our community is it's, it's not just the houses, but the people that own them. You talked about it. You said it as I was, I was raising my hand. Though most of our investors come from California. Now, it's funny that I can get ticketed for parking on my grass, but you'll charge me $5 to park at Starlight on the grass. You know, I, 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 ain't, I, ain't, I haven't figured that one out yet. But when you have people that own properties and, and they, they, they come from California, how easy is it for them to locate them? I mean, are, are, are you taking me to court uh, because you can find me? I mean, what is it? I mean, it, I, I, I'm, I'm like this. If you don't, uh, you don't respond, they take your house. How come we can't do the same things with those people in California? So a statistic that feeds into that, Pat, so you've got at the moment, I believe, well, the 1st of January of this year, you've got City Hall has 40 code enforcement agents 
and they have on their books around 14,000 properties. 14,000 properties. So for them, it's a case of priorities. Who can they reach the quickest? And the LLCs, the people who own these LLCs can be reached, but it's not as straightforward as it could be. And it's not as straightforward as the person who's actually living there, who's allowed paint to start peeling off the, the, uh, the outside, of those halls, outside of those walls. Just one point as well, we shouldn't forget that the biggest landlord, if you like, the biggest owner of these blighted properties is one owner. And it's not, not in California. Okay, it's City Hall. And they need to start seeing those properties as an asset, as an opportunity, and they, they need to start doing something with them to strengthen the community. Because if you've got a strong community, as we Pat talked about in the film in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it's a community that polices itself. It's a community that will have, see those violent rates uh, come down. But do you really think, though, uh, Major McHale, that uh, if we start uh, bulldozing abandoned homes, uh, get, get people into these houses, that somehow the crime rate goes down? What is the evidence for that? I started out when I was 21 years old at the old Linwood station at Linwood and Troost. All up and down Troost was uh, riddled, like Southern Prospect is right now. Investment does matter. I mean, Troost is coming back on the north end. Um, it's going to take time. You, can't, you have to have a long-range plan. You can't throw cops at it. We're extremely expensive. Arrest and prosecution isn't the answer. So it's looking at solutions that invest back in Troost, put people back in their homes, make the school systems more robust, and put people back to work. I can go to Linwood and Prospect, and I can go for miles around there and buy any kind of liquor or beer I could ever possibly imagine but I can only go to a couple places and buy a loaf of bread. That's a problem. More from the Crime Caucus in just a moment, but first, why are grocery stores so hard to come by on Kansas City's east side? Reporter Mike Sherry from KCPT's Hale Center for Journalism has been tracking the issue. Four years ago, Truman Medical Center had grand designs for this vacant lot at 27th and Troost. This was to be the site where the safety net health system would build a grocery store. People without access to fresh food would now have this option and learn how to repair it. Truman disappointed neighbors when it pulled the plug on the project in June. It was, it was a really bitter pill to swallow. I mean, um, primarily not only because it was the grocery store, but what they were trying to do with this particular grocery store. Um, it was creative. It was outside of the box of the standard grocery store model and I thought that it could be um, a real model for the types of things that we do need to do in the urban setting. Truman has acknowledged that lagging fundraising helped kill the project, but CEO Charlie Shields recently shed more light on that issue. Donors questioned Truman's ability to run an inner city grocery store. Leaders of the organization ultimately agreed. To run a grocery store in, in the urban core is a very challenging business and would require uh, a certain amount of risk uh, you know, in the endeavor, and some of that risk ultimately could have fallen back on the hospital. Neighbors remain upset by the rationale that Truman did not want to interfere with the city plan to open a Sunfresh at the nearby Linwood Shopping Center. Bookart feels it's an asinine concept that the area can't support two full-service grocery stores. City Councilman Jermaine Reed was equally miffed. The reality of it is, is that when we had the conversation some four years ago about the grocery store when uh, uh, the old administration at Truman was there uh, with John Bluford, the, the conversation about Linwood was always on the table. So this wasn't a surprise. This isn't a competition. We looked at this. We understood that the market would support uh, both grocery stores, uh, been full service grocery stores. And this is something that the community certainly has been looking forward to. Truman hopes to offer services at the Sunfresh that are similar to those envisioned for the store on Truce. Reed welcomed that plan and praised Truman for its commitment to improving the health of inner city communities. But some Eastside residents still feel shortchanged. They see stores like Save a Lot and Aldi as insufficient substitutes for the fully stocked markets in suburbia. I know people in our neighborhood that would never step foot in a Save a Lot, that would never step foot in an Aldi. Um, and uh, that's not to put a negative mark or light on Aldi or um, save a lot. But what it is to do is to say that our communities are varied just like every other community. Save a lot did not respond to requests for comment, but an Aldi executive said such perceptions are misguided. Mark Burstead, vice president of Aldi's Olathe division, 
said its stores carry a full line of fresh produce and satisfy customers' everyday needs. We are considered a limited assortment, uh, but we don't carry 10 or 12 ketchup items as an example. We just carry two. We carry our exclusive brand and then we also carry an organic exclusive brand. So we satisfy that need for ketchup without having eight feet of shelving for 12 different types of ketchups or sizes when it's all the same product. The company passes those savings on to consumers. KCPT visited nearly a dozen metro area markets and Aldi was the lowest priced option. Items we priced included bread, milk, and baby carrots. Convenience stores are often the only place to shop in poor neighborhoods, but Shields thinks Truman can help draw grocers to the urban core. I think our opportunity is to help create demand for fresh fruits and vegetables, and that, that opportunity will come through education. Bookhart agrees with that approach. We have to change behavior. You know, we have to change our food, um, uh, our food choices. We have to stop eating an overabundance of things that are, are terrible for us and start to transform our diet to one that um, is, is more conducive to our long-term health. I want to move back to our audience. Madam, you've been very patient. Your question, please. Where do we move forward with understanding that, yes, these houses are an issue, but they are not murdering our children and our fathers and our mothers and grandmothers. Pa so that okay. murdering that is continuing to happen is at a high rate because we're not addressing the substance abuse issues and we're not addressing the mental health issues, which leads to murder. Okay, so Pat I Paul. just would like to know, how are we going to address those Thank issues in our much. community? Pat? We have excuses for this and that, but, you know, a lot of folks say we, we're dealing with depression. Or, or, or we have mental issues. Uh, but a lot of those things come from what we don't have. You know, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, I listen to Alicia, you know, I, I don't want anybody to think because she's a council woman, she's blowing smoke up in you because she's not. She's a product of what she's talking about. You know, and that's what helped her actually get in there. You know, you, you need to have people that come from a place, that know a place, that's talking about a place. That's the same thing with our chief of police. You know, he knows exactly what we need because he come from the environment that he serves. But, the, but the, to, to go back to what Nina was saying, the only way we can move forward is we, we've got to keep talking to people. All the things that we discussed in the night, this place should have been standing room only. You know, and, and, and when I talk to you, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, okay, excuse me, of... excuse me. When I talk to you, I, I, I said a lot of folks probably won't come because of the weather and the way the streets are. But these are the same people that will call me tonight or tomorrow and say, how did it go? How did it go? Yes. Did y'all talk about this? Did you tell them about that? How about that hole? I have to say this all the time. You know, what about that hole in, in the middle of, of the street in front of my house? Water's coming out of it. You know, why didn't you do anything about it? I said, well, did you vote Tuesday? No, I didn't vote. I said, well, there it was. You, that's what you was voting for. And see, those are the things that we need to say when we knock it on the door. Okay, well, lots of KCPT viewers who are not here also called us about this event and had their own questions, like Alan in Kansas City, who says, these discussions about uh, crime fail to mention the fact that over 70% of black births are illegitimate. A one-parent home leads to poverty and no male authority figure, which often leads to crime. Why is this crucial fact not dis discussed? Are we too politically correct to point out this fact and openly discuss it? Well, I, I reject that. Uh, that that you, fact you're that rejecting you're that. Uh, look, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, I'm I, tossing I it that, to the ground here. Yeah. Ad hoc has recently started a program called Quenching the Father's Thirst, and essentially what it is about is making sure that that male is in his rightful place in the home and building a relationship with their child, regardless of the relationship that they may have or may not have with the mother of the child. And we think that that's really important, especially for those who are re-entering society from being incarcerated. Are we being too politically correct by not mentioning that topic? I, I was, Councilwoman Kennedy. I would say so, and um, I, I, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it is a factor. When you look at the, the individuals that are incarcerated, I'd say over 80% of them didn't have a father at home. 
Um, so that's not a coincidence. Um, but what that says is that not necessarily that that is uh, because you don't have a dad at home that you're going to end up in, in prison, but you do have a, you're more likely to, that there's a higher probability in some instances. But for having a community environment, I grew up, I didn't have a dad in the home. My mom raised three kids as a single parent. Um, and and I, I'm my mom's youngest child. Neither one of my brothers have been in prison. Um, and, and I'm an attorney today. I grew up in the same environment we're talking about where blighted houses and bad schools occurred. And so that's not always the outcome. And so I, I, you know, I think that this individual said what most people think. Well, if these people, you know, if they made better choices, but it's easy to criticize the person's choices when you don't know what they had to choose from. Councilman. Lucas. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's a political correctness problem. It's just that you're talking about something kind of useless. Um, the reason I say this is because Councilman Kennedy, myself, frankly, a lot of black people you bump into of our age these days grew up in very similar circumstances. And we're not all shooting at each other. I mean, some, let's get this straight first, right? 70% black illegitimacy, there aren't 70% of black people murdering each other every day. I'm not trying to cookie, uh, you know, sugarcoat anything, but at the same time, you know, to focus on that then suggests there's some broader social thing which gets into, to me, into more deeper racial views and all this sort of stuff. Look, we're all sitting here right now trying to make our communities as good and as strong as possible. And so I think if you actually want to, like, address real solutions, then you're going to look at the solutions we can have today. How can we get people into jobs? How can we get people into good schools? How can we get people into good houses? If you want to talk about generations of black life and culture, I guess get a PhD in sociology and talk about it, but I actually want to think about some solutions that are current for us now. So it's a, maybe it's a fascinating point, but yes, not sir. as interesting. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Paul Tancredi with the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association, which is the neighborhood where Paseo High School is. I think when we talk about things that coincide and things that cause crime, I'm not sure that it's the housing issue that's the cause of crime. When I think of the cause of crime, I think of the individuals they get into the criminal life, what can we do to help them um, develop as people so that they don't get into committing crimes? I think, um, what has happened to this person that has got them? And I think we kind of already... Who can answer that question? Major McHale? Neighborhoods aren't dangerous. There's a very small amount of people that live in our neighborhood are dangerous. Um, in Nova, we identified it's less than a thousand people that are driving the majority of violence in Kansas City. And the good citizens that live in these neighborhoods, they want them out just as bad as we do. That's how I'd answer that. And can look, can, uh, madam, please, madam, 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 you have spoken. We've got other people who can be asking questions. Madam, madam, stop. Madam, 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 you do not have the microphone. We're not recording you. We're not listening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, just, just. I haven't, I haven't finished over here. Okay, let me, can, can I continue on? Madam, thank you, thank you. Okay, Ken Novak over at UMKC. It has something to do with individual characteristics. It has to do with family. It has to do with community. It has to do with economics. It has to do with the school system. It, all of these factors play some role. And this is where I think NOVA and strategies like this are advantageous, is that it brings multiple groups to the uh, table to engage in strategic problem solving related to all of these issues and more. Part of the idea of uh, NOVA is to identify those individuals and those groups who are most prone to violence and most prone to be victimized by violence to give the community a little bit of breathing room so that we can have the conversations about economic development and gentrification and land bank and things like this. We have a question. Yes, sir. Joseph Jackson, president of Santa Fe. I have to agree with Major McHale. We have more liquor stores on every corner. If you go east, go west of Truce, you may find six. You go east of Truce, you have 30. When people get to the point where they have no hope, they're, we try to police our way out of this and send people to jail, now they're coming back. Their convicted felons can't find jobs, so the only thing they do is they can break in places and steal things and go to the liquor, corner liquor store. So until we begin to, one, get a way for them to have a way of employment, and two, reduce the number of liquor stores because of self-medication. We can't begin to spell community without the word unity, and we can't begin to fix our community until we begin to unify and help those people that are already there and need help in a problem. 
Are you ready to enact in an ordinance in Kansas City to restrict liquor stores, uh, Councilwoman Justice? We cannot have a conversation about how to end violence if we don't talk about every single issue that has been discussed here tonight. Okay. With, the, with the murder rate rising, the mayor puts together an anti-violence task force, puts you in charge. Now, there is a lot of cynicism, though, because there's, there's lots of blue ribbon panels and task forces in this community. Uh, is this just going to be another report that is put out and gathers dust on a shelf, Councilwoman Justice? Well, first and foremost, we've said we're not even putting out a report because the reality is, is we have an urgency that we've been talking about. And another report is not going to solve any problems. What we are going to do is have these conversations, these hard conversations like we're having here tonight, to see if there are incremental changes that we can make that when we pull them all together, we'll start to make a difference. If there's a sense of urgency, why is it that the findings of the task force don't become available until November? We are going to be every month, every step of the way, letting folks know what our ideas are. If we see something on January 20th that we think is a great idea and we can move forward with that, we will move forward with that. Hi, uh, earlier when we were beginning the conversation, Michael mentioned that he was very shocked by the type of disinvestment that exists in one of the country's wealthiest cities. Uh, and I generally think that there, there's a lot of wealth in the area, but some of that might exist across the state line. So I was wondering what the panel or perhaps specifically the councilmen and women think about, uh, d does the existence of the state line and the ability for companies, families, communities to hop across it impact this conversation of economic investment and the, the tax base that exists for investing in our city? Michael? I mean, the, the issue of TIFs has been raised, and TIFs are one tax incentive. Uh, they're in making the news at the moment. They're also uh, tax abatements, which work slightly differently, but have the same sort of uh, uh, effect as well, in the, in the sense that they shrink the tax base that's coming to the city, to City Hall, and shrink the tax base as well that's going to the taxing jurisdictions, <laughs> the likes of the school district, the likes of uh, Jackson County Mental Health Fund, the libraries, for example. Now, one of the things that we do talk about in the film, if I may, if just, just a moment on this, are the tax incentives that are offered across Jackson County between the years 2010 and 2014. And in those four years, nearly $400 million went to tax incentives. That's money that's not making its way into the public purse. For Kansas City, it was about $280 million. Now, add into the mix that these tax incentives, for the most part, are supposed to be targeting blight, and then ask yourself, where is the blight? Well, we know where it is. The blight is east of Truce. Where are they being offered? Massively so. Where are they being offered uh, in the vast majority? It's west of Truce. Go to the plaza, go downtown. This is where the tax incentives that are supposed to be targeting blight are in fact being offered. And when you ask the mayor, as I did, why are these tax incentives going west of Truce? It comes to your point. Because if we don't offer them, these companies will hop over the state line and go into Kansas. So who's being played here and who's losing out? But isn't that fair enough, though? They will go over to the other side of state line, wouldn't they, Councilwoman Kennedy? That is always a possibility. I mean, we, we're a bi-state area, regional area, and it's one Kansas City is how we look at it. Um, but big business does business. And they're going to go where they're going to get the best bang for their buck. And if Kansas is competing with Star Bonds and we've got TIF over here and we want to make sure we retain jobs for our residents, that's, that's sometime how this comes into play. But one other point I'd like to clarify is that these incentives are offered throughout the city. They're not only offered west of Truce. Um, if there are developers that want to, in, to develop east of Truce, we welcome them. I have a site at 63rd and Prospect I like to develop. We have the largest development, economic development project in the history of the state, the Cerner Project, happening in the 5th District yes. at the old Bannister Complex. And so when you look at those things, has a subsequent development occurred organically? It's supposed to target blight. Well, let me show, me the, show me the blight in the I, plaza. Well, I'm, we go downtown, where's the blight? I'm not arguing for the plaza. I can show you plaza. blight there to here that I, needs to be dealt with. I'm not arguing for the plaza. I made a point. People look at the city, but there's also the business community that has a role to play in this as well. We can't make them develop East of Truce, you but we make the incentives available to make it attractive as well. Now, there's a current argument saying if you take it away from the West of Truce, then they'll have to come East of Truce. But then you also just point out, well, no, they don't have to. They can go to Kansas or to St. Louis or 
or Omaha if they want. Still to come on the Crime Caucus, more questions and concerns from our citizens here in the auditorium of the Paseo Academy. But first, so many questions about TIFF. It keeps coming up in the conversation, but are you any the wiser on Kansas City's biggest tax incentive program? Here's TIFF in a GIF. Councilman Justice has said, it's a much broader discussion, but what's, what's very important is that we're having it, and we don't have a panel full of cops and prosecutors saying crime, crime, crime. We started with crime and dead children to now we're talking about incentives and development projects. This is a comprehensive conversation that's going somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, I would first of all I'd like to say uh, how encouraged I am about this, this type of dialogue. Uh, I, like to, I, I like to use the term ownership. We keep deferring all of these problems and ailments that we have to somebody else. The police department's got to fix it. The school district's got to fix it. Uh, uh, somebody else has got to fix it. When it's, We've got to take ownership of all of these things. And it's looking in the mirror. And then there was another question, and I'm, I'm through. It's always going to be a criminal mind. But if you give a guy an opportunity to 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 earn a decent living, a livable weight, a, liv a livable salary, $30,000, dollars $50,000, I guarantee you he will choose that over violence or crime. But where's the opportunity? But the, where are those 30, 40, 50,000 jobs? And are we going to be seeing those in the next year, two years, three years, four years of your city council term? on the east side of Troost Avenue, Councilwoman Kennedy? Um, I'm working with uh, a group of people right now on that very issue that's tied to the incentives. And in many major cities, anytime any uh, public dollars are put into a project, uh, there's a commitment of a, a number of jobs that go to residents of that city. Um, so while there's a, con a conversation about where they should go, um, that's still to be determined, but when they're issued, my, uh, my number I put out, my benchmark, is that at least 30% of those jobs should go to Kansas City and, uh, workers. Um, and in San Francisco, who has probably one of the best programs, they also have another uh, benchmark for those that come from disadvantaged communities. And that's not for federal Section 3 funds. This is for any type of tax incentive, public dollar. If the city owns the land and gives it to you for you to develop, then 30% of those workers, the new jobs, uh, go to work people from that city. And when you look at Kansas City and the, and the projections over the next 10 years, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of building. You know, there's a possibility of building a new airport. You know, we've had streetcar in here. We've got a convention hotel that may be coming in. So those are jobs where people are going to be making anywhere between thirty and $50,000 a year if they know up front that uh, this project is going to take three years and we need uh, 100 new workers and then and they've already agreed that 30 percent so that's 30 new Kansas City residents are going to be working on that job making you know uh, whatever the prevailing wage is for their trade that's opportunity that's how you make these incentives smart Terry writes a KCP viewer the problem is when people are shooting stabbing and beating others over arguments over property Facebook and other things that is a major issue you can blame drugs you can blame alcohol or drugs and guns but the real guilt lies with our failure to properly educate people in one basic problem solving 
Is Terry on to something? And what are we doing to fix it, Damon? Well, I talked about that earlier. Conflict resolution is something that we've got to be teaching our children at a very young age, and we need to carry that throughout schools. Adults have to model that. At, at, at the 27 vigils that I've done since I've been in ad hoc this year, the, the, every time I do a vigil, I always ask to have the kids in the center. And what I tell the folks is, us on the outer ring, we have to be the models for those kids to show them right from wrong, to show them how to resolve conflict without a gun. And so, you know, in, in a recent one, I asked folks to raise your hand if you want to break the cycle of violence. And not every hand rose. And I asked for why. Why, why are those of you who are here who don't know, I mean, those of you here who did not raise your hand, why didn't you? And one person honestly said, I don't know how. I don't know how. In, in, in the neighborhood, in the community that I live in, you, you, you have to be real with the kids that you deal with. Yeah, they don't have fathers around. But when we came up, there was always a daddy around, whether it was your neighbor, the man at the store, your pastor, or your coach. We had one. We have to go back to being that person again. Instead of showing these kids fear, show them how to live. Okay. Well, the gentleman earlier said, you know, we need to look in the mirror and, you know, what can we actually do? What one thing could we do, big or small, that could have an actual practical dent in the homicide rate in 2016 in Kansas City? Pat? Talk to these kids. Talk to them. Don't talk at them. Talk to them. Because, see, every kid out there selling drugs is not a drug dealer. Am I right? Every kid is out there because they, you don't know what that kid's past is unless you go into it. A lot of officers, and, and I can say this, a lot of police officers that, that we deal with now, they talk to these kids. You know, I can say that because the chief put people in the places they needed to be in. You know, you, there used to be a time where kids wouldn't approach police officers. In my neighborhood, I tell the kids, hey, when the cops roll up on you, don't run, run to them. I'm John Johnson, I live right over there. See, that, that right there, communication, that's what we need and that's what we lack it. What solution, big or small, could Kansas City employ in 2016 that, would, in your judgment, Michael, would have a dent in the homicide rate in this brand new year? The one thing that you could do is to make it easier for someone to purchase a land bank property and to, for them then to be able to do something with it. At the moment, the, um, the insurance title, they don't like, it comes with corrupt title and the insurance companies don't like that. That's a small thing that this city, along with Jackson County, could resolve. It's not glamorous, it won't get you a headline, there's no soundbite. It's about rolling up your sleeves as an administration and doing the gritty detail, getting that right, and then gradually over time, as you, as, you, as, you, as you cover all these different angles, the homicide rate should start. One practical solution, Councilwoman Kennedy, big or small, that you think would have a dent align in the homicide our, rate? Align our budget with the areas of priority that these residents in the high crime areas have expressed. We have tons of data that says these are the high crime areas. Here are the deficiencies in these areas. But when you look at the budget in Kansas City, our spending does not reflect those, things, those areas as priorities. Damon Daniel over at Ad Hoc Group Against Crime. One solution, big or small, that you think would make a difference? Teach our children and our neighbors the value of forgiveness. The value of forgiveness it can go a long way. It's one of the keys to resolving conflict. Jolie Justice. Continue this dialogue. Don't wait until the murder on your block before you show up for your neighborhood meeting. Um, keep talking. It's the only way we're going to fix this. And listen. And you're giving people an opportunity all year long. These meetings take place once a month on the second Tuesday of each month, and they're available to the public. Absolutely. And we're also adding a series of listening sessions, um, recognizing that people's schedules vary, and we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. Thank you very much. Major Joe McHale. I know this is going to be seen by a lot of people, so I would say if you're not affected about it, you are. Volunteer in your community. Teach a child to read. Boys and girls clubs. Big brothers, big sisters. Get involved. It is your problem. Quentin Lucas. Steal it and just say two to a 15-year-old. Over at the ATF, John Hamm. Work with us. 
let us know. If you've always got information that we don't have, we oftentimes take the blame for not being as reactive as what people think we should have. If you've got the information, get it to us. Well, but I'm, I'm not really quite sure uh, if I've got all the facts right. It doesn't matter. The smallest piece of information, if you know somebody's got a gun that shouldn't have one, or you know that somebody just bought a gun for somebody that's going to do something illegal with it or something violent with it, pick up the phone, call the police, call the ATF, let us know about it, let us get out there and, and proactively help you in your community. And in crunching all of those numbers, a solution that you feel could make a dent? Uh, Ken Novak over at UMKC? I, I'm going to suggest a piece of inaction. Uh, I'm going to say don't panic. Um, I'm going to say that uh, the evidence suggests very strongly that focused deterrence and this type of collaboration that occurs both with the community and various different law enforcement and prosecution partners uh, has demonstrated long-term effect in multiple cities. And so the homicide rate is not uh, what we would want it to be right now today, but I think a um, problem would be is if we are reactionary and panic and go back to doing things the way it used to be done because we know exactly what's gonna happen if that happens. Thank you, and we have an audience filled with people who haven't panicked because even on this snow-filled night, you felt enough about the crime issue that you wanted to come out here to the Paseo Academy and make sure we had this engaging conversation on crime. Thank you very much. All righty, this is just for camera purposes.